It's... That got even worse. It's the Brit Track uh, virtual panel behind the circus, the history of Monty Python. You may think that we are actually doing skits, but no, we were actually trying to do the music. But I suck at that. Trying. So <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Robin the Hat. I am the assistant director of the Brit Track. And uh, I have been, uh, this is my 21st year on staff for the Brit Track. And wow. I'll tell you what, I am very tired. Um, not as tired <laughs> as our director, though. Much. Yeah, she's actually, she's actually not here during this recording. So we're just going to say a big hi to Kara. Hope she uh, is taking a nap at the moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are going to be talking about uh, the history of Monty Python uh, tonight. So with me, I have a couple of great Python fans. Uh, to my immediate right, I have John Rabin, who is one of my fellow co-hosts on the Monty Python Experience. Wow. Say hi, John. Hello. And then underneath me, I have Miss Elizabeth Murphy Spivey, who is a huge Monty Python fan and is currently making her own hat. I am making my own hat. I'm actually done with it. It's quite nice. Ah. What kind of a hat are we talking about here? Uh, my friend and I are doing a 1891 gender bent Sherlock Holmes and Watson. Oh. Um, so we're doing like 1891 wa walking suit. So I made like a tweed hat that kind of looks like a deer stalker, but it's a lady's hat. It's going to be very exciting. Going to steer us back on to topic. <laughs> it was my fault we got off. In the is this time for the first, and now for something now completely for something, different? And yes, we're supposed and to be talking about. And now for something completely different, the top. The plot. All right. Oh, today you're all too silly. <laughs> yes. It's a man's life in Brit Track. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dog's life, man's life in the Brit Track. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to start off by just talking about, uh, you know, the, the members of Monty Python. I guess we could start off talking about uh, uh, mm -hmm. John Cleese. Anyone want to start the, the, the conversation going? Well, you know, it's uh, John is almost one of those people that you, you would think was destined for a, a, some kind of life where he was known. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just the, the, his height alone, especially in Britain in the 1960s, you know, he was the least uh, of the pythons who was able to just kind of obscurely walk the streets. Um, and it almost never happened in the sense that he was really like before he fell into, uh, I think it was like Cambridge footlights and, and whatnot, um, was going to become a solicitor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, just through I think he would have been just as good at that. Like he would have, yeah. he would have blended right into that too. Like, I think he, do you know what I'm saying? Yes. He would have come. I'm completely convinced he would have been successful at, at that as well. He actually yeah. got a law degree, didn't he? Yes. I think so. And just did not, like he was supposed to um, join some firm that represented the Bank of England and mm -hmm. uh, decided after university they wanted to go into comedy instead. And uh, basically they told him, like, well, he wasn't, he didn't tell them he was going into entertainment. He told them he was going to work for the BBC. Because mm -hmm. that was a little more respectable. <laughs> and it was him and Chapman, right? Uh, yeah, I want to say so, yes. Because uh, they'd yeah. been long-time friends and collaborators. Um, and Chapman was himself going to be a doctor before he went into entertainment. Mm-hmm. 
I forgot about that. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that uh, uh, segues us brilliantly to uh, Graham Chapman. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, who uh, is unfortunately not with us anymore. He was the first Python to die, mm -hmm. uh, but it was uh, very sad. He was also uh, one of the weirdest, I think, because you just had that uh, demented sense of humor. Whenever you mm -hmm. saw uh, one of his one of his skits that he wrote, uh, it was you just knew that you weren't going to be able to figure out how it was going to end. It is one of those situations where, you know, you can see the influence of John on him. It kind of bring mm -hmm. him back down to earth a little bit. It, like I, I like mm -hmm. in, uh, Graham's thinking and humor a lot to Noel Fielding and sense of if you don't have somebody to balance him out, it kind of gets almost nonsensical. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Well, there a lot of their early stuff, uh, uh, like the uh, at last the nineteen forty eight show, uh, and mm -hmm. um, oh my god, what's that other one I'm thinking of? Uh, um, the Frost guys. Report. Yes, the Frost Report, especially. Yeah, yeah, those were the two big shows that they worked mm -hmm. on before uh, starting Python. Um, Elizabeth, uh, talk about another of our uh, esteemed Pythons. Do you know I have a very soft spot in my heart for Michael Palin? Um, Isn't everyone? I do. There's just something so gentle about him. Do you know what I'm saying? Like foul-mouthed but gentle at the same mm -hmm. time. Yes. Um, you know, I, I have a type, you, I like, guess. But thinks he's all nice and and polite and everything, and he is, but he's also got that mm -hmm. side. <laughs> mm hmm. And I think that and, plays in his comedy, too, because often he's like this, you know, well, I mean, I guess they all played women, but, you know, he would he would bring this softer side and then he would just kind of let it rip. I'm trying to think of a good example, but um, yeah, no, the, so uh, I, oh, I. The barber. Yeah. 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 That one's one of the biggest, like, to me, that's one of the most iconic ones, too. Like, that's one that people can always sing along, you know? It's Absolutely. so simple, but... I mean, he was also the other part of uh, The Dead Parrot. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 One of the things I loved about that was um, it was based on, or at least this was an interview with, with John Cleese he was talking about, was that they based uh, Michael's character on a uh, used car salesman who sold Michael cars and yes, exactly. like, Michael would call up like, Oh, it's, uh, it's got, a, it's the, the gearbox is a bit sticky. Oh, you know, it's a sign of a quality car, you know, just kind of that, that slimy sort of, um, you know, underhanded business person. Mm -hmm. The full prefect, mate. Beautiful paint job. It's not a matter of the paint job. <laughs> um, if, I, if I may, I wanted to talk about, like, uh, Terry Gilliam. Oh, yes. Yeah, because, you know, it's... You've got the other, you know, five members who all, like, are British, went to mm -hmm. Oxbridge... You know, very proper middle class sort of lives, and then you've got Terry, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Minnesota born, uh, off the wall, artsy guy, who it seemed to be like I think more than the others, just seemed like he kind of stumbled into it. It's like Mad Magazine, yeah. You know, yeah. Well, I mean, he literally, I guess. Mad Magazine when he was younger. Mm -hmm. Um, and then well, just, you know, decided he wanted to get more into television and met somebody who introduced him to everyone else. And, you know, history was born. It mm -hmm. was his animations that really uh, brought together their uh, disparate skits into one kind of stream of consciousness show. Because mm -hmm. it yeah. always uh, took us from one scene to another mm -hmm. through the most mind-bending it's your courteous roots 
Yeah, and they they decided that they never wanted to do just um, you know the punchline sort yeah. of humor of previous uh, shows and comedy, and it just because you know, the punchline was never as funny. Well. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he so could cover like, okay, a lot of ground plot wise too with his mm-hmm. animations. Like I would, mm-hmm. I would argue that Holy Grail is one that like everybody's seen, whether you're a Monty Python fan or no. Yep. Um, and I feel like so much, like his animations were so iconic to people who don't really know that much about the group in general. And it was like, for this for this long movie, he could cover a ton of plot just by, by being like, and then they ate the minstrels. And it's like, okay, great, moving on. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. he did so much for the group, but, but it was in a way that you didn't, you just kind of take for granted because his mm-hmm. his animations are so intrinsic to just the whole experience. It's it's brilliant yeah. as far as I'm concerned. And even like in the series proper, um, he had longer memorable cartoons instead of just things that tied the scenes together. Like if you remember the, uh, the story about the prince and the spot, <laughs> you know, where it's like, oh, the prince gets a spot, turns out to be cancer, but then the cancer takes on a life of its own. <laughs> like, why are we laughing at cancer, but he made yeah. it funny. You know? yeah, it becomes the protagonist of the rest of that story. <laughs> he was good on screen too, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. like that worked too. Like he's, he's doing all this brilliant stuff. And like, there he is like front and center too, playing all these characters. Like it's, it's pretty, it's pretty brilliant. Yeah. Now I mean, that we're talking I, about it, I'm thinking more about it and I'm, I'm really impressed. I feel like it took a while because I remember like watching like the early seasons and he just shows up as the knight with the chicken. <laughs> yeah. Or he's a background character. He has no lines or anything, but you know, over time he becomes more of a performer uh, when that really wasn't his background to start. Especially uh, when police started getting tired of being part of Python mm-hmm. near the end there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we have two pilots we haven't talked anything about. Uh, one of them is Terry Jones, the other mm-hmm. uh, director of uh, the of the group. Um, he mm-hmm. directed uh, uh, Life of Brian and uh, Alder Grail and um, Meaning of Life. Mm-hmm. That's right. And yeah, and he. Uh, uh, his uh, skit style was more of the pastoral uh, panning across and uh, coming across someone strangling someone else in the middle of a beautiful field next to yeah. a running stream. Yeah. And with him, you also get the characters that are, I think, almost the most outlandish. Um, you know, just whether it's the nude organist. Uh, I think <laughs> more than anybody else uh, on the show. Um, Mr. Creosote. Yes. Um, <sighs> oh, no, my God. <laughs> oh. Just contributes. Oh, I can't get another bite. <laughs> uh, please, uh, he's wafathin. Wafathin. Oh, I'm still All right. <laughs> get the bucket. So gr- <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, I mean... Uh, I, I remember I was rewatching the um, the 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 true Monty Python the Truth uh, documentary, and they show him in he's, he's almost giving like an economics report, but he's stripping. That was amazing. Yes, that was amazing. On his nipples, and he's flinging them around. So I exports <laughs> this year are going to do going to increase. <laughs> And then last but not least, we have Eric Idle, the musician yes. of the group, who wrote so many classic songs. Oh, my gosh. Okay, yeah. I really Him enjoyed the Monty Python, and the Truth, Truth miniseries that you're talking about. Oh, sorry. Yes. I've got a little lag, so I did not mean to cut you off. Uh, that, <laughs> that documentary was absolutely amazing. Um, and one of the best parts to me was kind of like the background of the music and how he would just sometimes just pull something together. He'd go home and start strumming some chords and then just like come back with like every sperm is sacred or something like that. You know, it's, it's pretty, it's brilliant. Or always look on the bright side of life. Yeah, it's 
that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the universe song. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. He's talk about they like they basically wrote the philosopher's song just because he liked all the names and thought they lended themselves to music. So they all got drunk and he wrote a song. I mean, yep. all the philosophers. That was amazing. And what I love about that too is that now that like spam a lot is and heavily performed, it's like all of these things that he wrote, you know, just on the fly on his guitar like they're now like things that you know what I like it's mainstream it's broadway right. it's it's musical mm -hmm. theater it's people auditioning for musicals with songs that he wrote for an episode of something you know i love yeah, that and it's it, and it's not like even like stuff from way back when but it's the newer stuff it's um it is you know the spam a lot it's um oh shoot i can't remember the name of the uh of the uh, the one they did about Life of Brian, um, uh, not the Messiah. We... That's it. Oh yeah, not the Messiah. Yes, yes. Not that's got some very good songs in it as well. Um, yes, I mean, the one that always comes to mind, at least for Spam a lot, is um, the Lancelot song. His yes. name is Lancelot. He likes to <laughs> dance a lot. He's a Lancelot. You know you do. I do. <laughs> now, one thing I didn't know about Eric Idle is that he actually directed a couple of music videos for George Harrison. I knew he and Harrison were friends. Oh, yeah. But I didn't know he actually directed a couple of music videos by him. Well, you know, Harrison cut a check for Life of Brian, so I think he owed him. <laughs> I have yeah. no idea how many like rock stars were grassroots supporters of Monty Python. That kind of blew my oh, mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that's partially how um, Holy Grail got financed as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, rock stars and Playboy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, George Harrison by any means, cameo, right? Mm -hmm. uh, George Harrison has a cameo in uh, the Life of Brian as the owner of the mount that Jesus is is doing his sermon on. Oh, are so you I serious? I don't remember if he actually said. Yeah, I, I don't remember if he actually says it. anything, but that's him. Yeah. Yeah, and I love the, um, I love when he was asked about why he funded the movie, and uh, he said, "Well, because I want to see it." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Eric Idle <laughs> yes. said, "You know, that's the most expensive movie ticket anyone's ever purchased." <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he like? He like financed his apartment or something to pay for it too. I mean, he was committed. I mean. Not yeah. like he had like a tiny apartment, but I think it was probably like one of his properties. But he definitely, yeah, yeah he wasn't hurt in the game. Money, George wasn't no, but. also <laughs> true. <laughs> but still, thank you for your service, sir. Yes, much appreciated. And um, mm -hmm. you know, speaking of Beatles, who were fans, I mean, they did say in the documentary that. Um, Paul McCartney would actually stop recording and make everyone watch the show when it came on. Awesome. I loved that. I also loved that um, Elvis was apparently a super fan yes. and made everybody watch Holy Grail. I love All right, that you gotta too. watch this up. You gotta, you gotta look at that bunny there. <laughs> That's the funny bunny right there. That's gonna do something you're not gonna expect. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so Monty Python ran for four years from what sixty nine to seventy three. Uh, so, yeah, they it was it was uh, the sayest four seasons was really more three and a half because they only did six of the the final thirteen episodes of right. season four. Um, and uh, uh, they got together because I think it was uh, was it Cleese and Chapman who got a deal after being on the frost report and then so. the yeah. other guys just kind of came in uh they yeah. brought them in because they really liked how they worked yeah i mean they'd all known each other uh even back in back in university because you know you mm -hmm. had the the oxford cambridge rivalry and they would go to each other's shows mm -hmm. um so you know once they got into the bbc they're like working on different shows they're like oh well why don't we all do something together mm -hmm. all right and so now for something completely different the, plot. the track 
exactly. So uh, they, uh, the Pythons loved writing. They didn't really consider themselves uh, actors, comedians. They really considered themselves writers who just got mm -hmm. up and performed their stuff. So they would uh, uh, kind of split off into groups. Usually Cleese and Chapman would go off in their own group. Mm -hmm. And then Palin and Idol uh, and uh, Jones would go off uh, do their thing and then mm -hmm. they'd meet and they'd share what they had and they'd critique each other and offer suggestions and stuff like that and that's how that's how uh, the the show was written and there was no really uh, competition for choice parts because like I said they didn't really consider themselves actors mm -hmm. so it, it worked out very well uh, for the group and you see, uh, you know, there are like members of the of the troupe that play certain characters, although it can it can, of course, vary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get an example like the, the parrot uh, sketch where, you know, Cleese is the straight man and Palin is the kind of the, the crazier, wackier mm -hmm. character of mm -hmm. the two. And then you get to the fish license and it swaps. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'd like to buy a license for my pet fish, Eric. My pet fish. <laughs> you do a pet fish named fish. Eric. <laughs> Just for a good man, I got a, I got a license for my pet dog, Eric, and I got a license for my pet cat, Eric. <laughs> you don't need a cat license. Yes, I so pretty much do. Well got one. <laughs> From the Ministry of Elsons. Never seen so many blue hairs. Elsons? <laughs> so it was spelled on the van. The it's man so said <laughs> his van could, his equipment could detect a cat from 300 yards. And Eric, being such a nappy cat, was a piece of cake. <laughs> all right, all right. Stop being so silly. I had all those skits memorized in high school, and I would walk down the hallway between classes just quoting Monty Python. Yes. I, uh, when we. My senior year of high school, when we um, we would do the Canterbury Tales, and uh -huh. uh, you could dress as pretty much any character from uh, from the books. So I was the knight, and I intentionally got a coconut, sawed it in half, emptied it out, so I would have them for our our pilgrimage to a local diner. <laughs> nice, that's fantastic. So, we. We had one of those like super conservative households where we weren't allowed to watch anything. Like we couldn't watch Ninja Turtles. We couldn't watch anything. But my dad was a massive. I mean, they're they're not. Everything is very different now, and like we watch everything. But and I'm 40, so obviously my parents don't tell me what. To... Okay, I'm gonna get back on track, you guys. Uh, ADHD. <laughs> See, What's I'm that? like, Ooh, I... I know Ex <laughs> squirrel. So. My dad was a huge Monty Python fan. And so we were we were allowed to watch that. That was like one of the exceptions to the rule. Like no Bart Simpson, but we could absolutely watch Holy Grail, except it was the edited cut. But that was kind of magical too, because I didn't watch the entire thing until I was like 21 and was I like got it on DVD. Do you what? One, do they make do they make a version of the movie for conservative Christians? Yes. <laughs> well, they cut out the curse words, any reference to like you know, oral sex and um, definitely some of the grotesque violence, but not all of it, mind you. And for some reason, they cut out Tim the Enchanter. And I think that must have been for time because there's nothing shady about Tim the Enchanter. But yeah, you know, yep. so I watched it when I was 21 and I was like, I know, I felt like I was like given the biggest gift because suddenly in my life there was Tim the Enchanter where he wasn't Aww. there before, but I know. <laughs> I know. I got to experience the magic all over again. It was great. I warned you. I mean, we've had a few. We've had a few pythons uh, over time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Terry Gilliam was here twice at Dragon Con. Yeah. Uh, and Terry we had Jones never a year on there. Terry Jones. Yeah, he was there a couple of years before he passed away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very sad. He was getting in his car. I said his name. He looked at me briefly. <laughs> so that's that's my that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Aww. Like I wa never washed this mouth again. I'm just my eyes. <laughs> God, <I'm> <laughs> Too much dirt. 
-hmm. Yeah, he doesn't have a beard. He just hasn't washed his face in five years. <laughs> exactly. It works. No judgment. <laughs> so, um, steering us back on track. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite behind the scenes story of uh, Python uh, there, Elizabeth, of the show? Oh, um, <clears throat> I'm not good at this. Okay, I can do this. Can someone else go first? Yes. I just panic and my it's mind John. went blank. Hold on. Okay. I, I'm trying to John. Think. Of, uh, of something show related. Um, <laughs> What's your favorite behind the scenes uh, anecdote for Monty Python's Flying Circus, John? Uh, well, I think it's um, prior to John leaving and they were filming somewhere else in England and they were having just an absolute terrible experience with the hotel. And yes, yes. The hotel owner was just this terrible, awful man. And uh, the rest of the group decided they were going to leave and go stay somewhere else. But John's like, no, no, no. I'm going to stay and I'm going to observe this guy. <laughs> and then, then that's pretty much how Faulty Towers was born. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Uh, mine, uh, it's not so much an anecdote, but it's kind of the reason the, the uh, spam skit was written. Uh, during World War II, of course, uh, getting food to Britain was very, was very important. So the Americans sent just shiploads of spam. And uh, everyone had spam. It was all over the place. And it, it lasted forever. Mm -hmm. So they had spam for years after the war was over and the, an entire generation was just thoroughly sick of it. So the, uh, that's where that skit came from. You know, everything on the menu is spam because at one point it was pretty much true that spam was the only thing on the menu. If you wanted meat, you had spam. And yeah. uh, I think it's particularly interesting it's because of that skit that we call junk email spam. Mm -hmm. Are you serious? Yeah. Spam Aww. email. I'm love, glad I knew um, that now. If you went if you went to spam a lot, you know, they had the exclusive spam tin. Uh well, with spam in it, obviously. Mm -hmm. It was like a honey glazed uh spam flavor. And uh, I don't think I opened that for about two years before. Did you I... actually open it? Eventually, yeah. Okay. How was it? I, I thought it was pretty good, but I, I like spam uh, generally. Like, I don't think it's that bad. Uh, mm -hmm. But then again, I'll eat just about any manner of disgusting potted meats uh, <laughs> or, you know, potted? from from that to haggis. So, uh it, does, it doesn't bother me, and I always like because there's this one grocery store here that stocks a whole bunch of different flavors of it. And I'll go there every once in a while and get some. <laughs> that was really interesting, John. Oh. So, Elizabeth, what is your anecdote that you have for behind the scenes? <sighs> okay. Um, I actually, like, I just watched the Netflix documentary and it was delightful. I think anybody watching this who wants to learn more, I mean, in, even if you don't want to, it's, it's just fun to watch. It's really entertaining and they're all so engaging and they're all so different. Like it's really nice to get even more of a read on their personalities. But um, after apparently, well, life of Brian, when it came out, there was quite a lot of controversy, which remains to this day, you know, I didn't watch it for the first time until I was in my 20s too. Um, but apparently there was this one evening where I think it was John Cleese and maybe like Michael Palin <clears throat> went for like a live, basically theological and sociological debate with some like high ranking yes. clergy members. And like, they, they did the thing, frankly, like they had wonderful things to say having been raised in a very like having been raised in a religious environment and having heard that life of brian was about as 
catastrophically like you know you can watch this mm -hmm. but you'll get struck down by lightning when i finally did get around to watching it i was like this has some good things to say uh and it was interesting watching that documentary because they they felt that way too they were like hey we actually like read the bible and then we translated <laughs> some of it into this film um and i i i thought there was a lot about it that was admirable and relevant mm -hmm. and I don't know. So it was it was interesting watching um, watching them go head to head with some powerful clergy members and just um, lay down some logical and well informed arguments. You know, it's mm -hmm. one of the things that I profoundly adore about Monty Python is how intelligent they all are. Like you can learn so much just watching these crazy skits they do. Mm -hmm. You can learn about philosophers. You mentioned the we were talking about the philosopher sketch earlier them getting drunk but then there was also like the soccer game do you guys remember yes. Yes. the philosopher's soccer game it was yes. so freaking brilliant but uh, if you're actually listening like, there's so much about it but neat, uh, so, uh, it's, like, uh, 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 it's so good but like i think yeah what was it um yes well i mean yeah, like because they're music, calling out some uh, of the theories as they're announcing the names mm -hmm. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. is, uh, so I mean, I think uh, Confucius of having no free will. Confucius, he says, name go in book. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I mean, there's so much about it that I mean, it's yeah. it's so it's so brilliant, and like you can read how how smart they were when you watch mm -hmm. it, and I I love. love moments like that when they're winners, they're more than just like these men who dress in dresses and like you know whack parrots on a counter like they are brilliant well-read uh men yes. they took the time to research this i love how they mm -hmm. you know they were talking about like they read the dead sea scrolls they read the bible like they did a lot of work to and make this thing, thing accurate and then they sat down and argued it i love it the thing about life of brian is that it doesn't really make fun of jesus not no, at all they treat him treated with very respect. respectfully throughout it actually makes fun of 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 uh, the people who follow uh, uh, ideas blindly, because yeah. you know you got this guy Brian. He's not the Messiah. He says it throughout the entire movie, yet people insist he is, and they do whatever he says. Uh, he just, he takes a similar journey to Jesus, but uh, the, in the few scenes that Jesus is in the movie, he's he's doing what they said he did in the in the in the bible you know he it's he treated very respectfully yeah so he's yeah and it's it's brilliant the way they're lampooning not jesus but the people who uh use his teachings to mm -hmm. uh, make excuses for anything but aren't those the people who had the biggest backlash against the film you know like me thinks yep. the lady doth protest too much. Well, when you turn a mirror on them, they don't really like the look of their own reflection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, uh, at the risk of uh, diverging again, I mean, look at the uh, uh, Dogma by mm -hmm. Kevin Smith. Mm -hmm. You know, that the best film ever. It's it's it literally it takes the what's written in the Bible and interprets it literally, and uh, you know he got so much grief over that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah and I um, we joined the protests and got interviewed by yes. yes. <laughs> I actually showed it to some friends of mine that I'm like involved with through like a church organization, mm -hmm. and we got to the end, and one was like, "Actually, that that ending was a little bit too positive for me." Like <laughs> these people were not. I mean, they were acknowledging that Dogma had a kinder view of God than actually like. Relig like often religious films can, you know, mm -hmm. I, I love it, but God was played by Alanis Morissette. So womp womp, you know, how ironic, but that was oh, one of my favorite bits, I really think and just like scampers away. Like, yes, <laughs> Beep. that was so cute. I yeah. love that movie. So, but right. you know, that again, that was uh, uh, a movie that was heavily influenced mm -hmm. as were, almost every comedian and, com and comedy troupe after Python, they were heavily influenced by them. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from South Carolina. And uh, 
Strom Thurmond got the movie banned in the state. <laughs> You know, that guy. Yeah. So he, he had his moments, uh, mm -hmm. but that was yep. not one of them. Not one of them. No. So speaking but. of films, mm -hmm. uh, can anyone tell me what the first Monty Python film was? Yes. Uh, and now for something completely different. That's yeah. right. Which was and a... Essentially, but it, it, and I think it is, um, it's a great introduction for people who don't know what my, Monty Python is. Um, because, you know, it was, a, it was a film that was basically put together a bunch of their greatest hit scene uh, sketches and distributed in America just to get us Americans familiar with them as a comedy group. And it did its job. It uh, was released in 72. And then again, it was released in America in 74. And that was when Python really started taking off over here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, sorry, someone was going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, it's basically, um, it made the other movies possible, I think. Yes. Yes, it was. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to think that nobody, like, once they'd done that and it wasn't a huge critical or commercial success, pretty much the mm -hmm. British film industry wrote them all off. And then they come in with Monty Python and the Holy Grail <laughs> and basically, you know, it's just regularly voted one of the best comedy movies, movies of all time. time. Yeah. And uh, this was just a um, good movie. One thing I take for yeah. granted is that it was just a quality movie. Like, that was one yeah. thing that that documentary really emphasized was yeah. how like believably middle ages it was with the fog rolling mm -hmm. in and the mud everywhere. Like it was just a well done movie, comedy aside, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, did it so some lovely filth down here? Whoa. <laughs> How'd you do? How'd you do, good lady? Bang. Uh, oh, one of my favorite stories from that, like if, if we want to do behind the film, behind the scenes film stories, Mm -hmm. is um, they were originally uh, hooked up with um, Historic Scotland to use castles all throughout the country for filming. And then <laughs> Historic Scotland basically found out what they were intending to do and they pulled <laughs> their uh, approval and they could not use any publicly owned castle in Scotland, which is why Doan Castle is the one that's pretty much used for nearly everything. Um, and reportedly the owner of the castle might have been drunk when he agreed <laughs> to let them film there. Um, but it was it's it's great. And I, I'm not sure if they still do this, but the um, audio tour of doing castle is um, is done by Terry Jones. And now, of course, Aww. it's it's famous not just for My Python, but it was also mm -hmm. one of the locations of Winterfell from uh, Game of Thrones. Oh. Stop I it. I had no yes. idea. So it's a it's pretty well-known castle. I think they did a really good so job of... Um... I think it's one of the few private castles. I was just going to say, with clever use of angles, you wouldn't know. It was... Sorry. So oh, yeah. does, Winterfell, does Winterfell have a grail shaped beacon? <laughs> oh, naughty, wicked, <laughs> bad suit. <laughs> she deserves a spanking. A spanking? Well, actually, that, that was one of my favorite behind the scenes things from Holy Grail was apparently mm -hmm. um, there was never enough hot water to go around at the hotel like they would all like race to get back to the hotel to try to get showers and finally like I think it was just like the main Python members were like screw it we're getting out of here and then they go down the road <laughs> to another hotel and that's when they figure out that's where they were keeping all like the virgins from Castle Anthrax and they were like ah. <laughs> I thought that was funny Uh, nice. Well, I, I tell you what, guys, we are coming near the end of uh, our our 
panel. Um, but we do have another movie to talk about, and that is uh, The Meaning of Life. Mm -hmm. Which is their last like real film uh, that had a, well, going to say plot, but it doesn't really. But it's, a, it's the movie that is really most like uh, the original series mm -hmm. in that it's a series of vignettes. That's true. Uh, yep. But there's there's no animation from Terry Gilliam in that movie, is there? I I, I don't know. I, I I never realized that. I never really thought about that before. But I mean, we have that animation during the universe song, but I don't think that's Terry Gilliam. Because at that that's point, true. he was you know directing movies of his own, and he just didn't really have the time. I mean, he does do the the short at the beginning. Yes, yes, he directed uh, the um, well, the Crimson the Permanent Insurance. insurance. Yeah. Yes, Crimson Permanent Insurance. Yes, and which you know, it's like if you look at that movie and you look at everything else he's ever directed, like you see the uh, the formation of his artistic style in that mm -hmm. short film. Like the camera angles, the effects, mm -hmm. it's all there. And there's a very young Matt Frewer in that. That's, are uh, you that serious? Scene. Yes. Way before he was Max Hedrum. <laughs> he's the he's the one I think he he has the sword, he he throws it down and he cusses and he jumps out the window. Let's see. Sorry, my phone keeps lagging. Okay, so I um I love that every sperm is sacred song. Like I love how it's such a like Oliver children yes, musical yes. experience. And it's, it's that is not a song you should be singing out in public. That That's one of my favorite Monty Python songs. <laughs> that was okay, uh, I think we used to sing in high school to the uh, chagrin of our of one of our teachers. Um, who was the? He, she was the cool teacher, but she still kind of give us a side eye, like you, you shouldn't do that here. Did mm -hmm. she get quite irate? <laughs> well, a little irate. <laughs> uh, maybe not quite irate. I think I did more stuff to make her irate just for walls. <laughs> well, she can't Don't argue that every sperm is sacred, so she couldn't really, you know, shoot that yes. down. <laughs> they go and all the kids go dancing down the the, the road know, it's so cute. medical experimentation. More than, <laughs> more than the song, I just I love the father like having to come in and give the bad news to his kids. Like, Aww. well, I'll listen to you over the mill. You know what that means? I'm gonna have to sell you all to scientific experimentation. Oh no, 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 we knew the stake would come. <laughs> <laughs> but it's down a like a. That means I could put one like, of these on like my. Like a nineteen sixties spectacular film, you know. <laughs> yes, but it's, 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 it's such a good um, riff on Catholicism versus Protestantism as mm -hmm. well, because you've got the guy who's like, "Oh yes, I could wear a condom and have sex whenever I wanted," and his wife, played by Graham, is like, "You wear that sounds Ooh. great." It's like, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> 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 I might have the freedom. I might have the freedom to to have sex more, but I'm not going to do it because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a gonna... Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> and the last skit with death, uh, yes. that's a particular favorite of mine too. And not just because Simon Jones of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fame is one of the characters. Now remember, remind me which one was he in Hitchhikers? He was Arthur Dent. Oh yes, yes. I thought so. I just I wasn't sure. <laughs> he was Arthur in the original radio show and in the television series. Yeah, it's been a while mm. since I've seen the television series. Uh, it is on. Okay, remind me of um, the author who wrote Hitchhikers Guide to the Galaxy. Somebody help me out here. Douglas Adams. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Douglas so Adams. Douglas Adams actually made a computer game in the 90s did you guys ever play it uh -huh. starship titanic no it was freaking brilliant it was so good it was too hard for me because i was young 
Um, I think it was like mid to late nineties, but it was almost entirely voiced by pythons. Like all of the characters were like John Cleese. And I mean, it was and everybody. So I, book, I love that. The, there was a book based off of that video game that was written by Terry Jones. Oh, it was a real, oh, it was such a good mm -hmm. game, but it was too hard for me. All right. Uh, but I played it anyway, because I loved hearing John Cleese be a parrot, you know? <laughs> Like a space All right, parrot. So before we before we run out of too much time, I'm I'm curious what everybody's uh, favorite post Python work is. Oh, it's got to be a fish called Wanda for me. <laughs> oh God, yeah, it's, it's so good. Yes. Yes. I love um. I really love Michael Palin's travel series. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, you do have to give it to a fish called Wanda. Tell those pigs to off. <laughs> pigs. <laughs> I I think that probably Star Ship Titanic is my favorite fish called Wanda is up there for sure. I mean, yeah. John Cleese, right? He's he's so funny, and yet he works as a a leading mm -hmm. man. You know what I'm saying? Like it mm -hmm. it. His ability to blend into the different roles, I think, is actually pretty spectacular, especially coming from like an education. Like he really he is one of those people who could have done anything, you know, I'm glad yeah. he did what he did. But and then you get him in so many good like side roles as well, um, like the first couple Harry Potter films and uh, yes, like he takes over for Desmond. Oh, Lowe. yeah. Mm hmm. Sorry, what did you say, Rob? So, yes, he was nearly headless Nick. Yes. Yes, he was. Yes. He was. It's, I forgot about it that. It still burns me that uh, they left Rick Mayall on the cutting room floor. I know. <laughs> that sounds, I would love to see him as Peeves. Yes. Yeah. Which was nice when they did that um, like Hogwarts reunion special on HBO Max. Mm -hmm. And they did they did the in memoriam of everyone who'd passed since the films were made and they included Rick in it. Oh so I thought was nice. Even though we never saw him on screen. Yeah. Indeed. And uh, we've lost two Pythons mm -hmm. so far. Yep. We lost uh poor Graham Chapman to uh, mm -hmm. his alcoholism and then we lost uh Terry Jones or complications from his uh um dementia. Uh, when he was at DragonCon, he was actually suffering from it. Yeah, it was like the okay. earliest stages of it, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah Before but my I, time. I how how beautiful was Graham Chapman's funeral, though? Oh, And great. John's eulogy. <laughs> he would have loved it, yes. He would have loved it. <laughs> he would hate me if brilliant. I didn't, if I wasn't the first person to say he would have. in an English funeral. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I want to thank John. I want to thank you, Elizabeth. I want to thank you for this wonderful panel. Uh, I know we, we got some of the behind the scenes. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot more. Uh, things that you can look out for is uh, yeah. the not the 1948 show. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, oh, what is that other one? Um, we have, sorry, I'm actually looking at my phone. Excuse me. Uh, Do Not Adjust Your Set, which has a very young Michael, uh, uh, Eric Idle, uh, Michael Palin, and Terry Jones on it. Uh, that is on uh, BritBox. And then we have uh, like the old uh, skits from the Frost Report. Those can be found on YouTube, yep. where uh, Marty Feldman was actually one of the four Yorkshiremen. Uh, Peter Cook was a substitute python uh, during uh, the Secret Policeman's Ball, which was a series of movies, uh, a series of stage performances that were used to raise money for Amnesty International, of which uh, John Cleese was a co-founder. Mm -hmm. So you can find really? you can find those skits. Yes, and uh, I've written I've written quite a lot about Monty Python for Anglotopia. So if uh, you go on anglotopia.net and either look for my name, John Rabin, or Monty Python, you'll find any number of uh, interesting facts, pieces I've written, locations from filming, um, you know, different stories about 
their founding and their history. So it's all worth it's all worthwhile stuff. And I'm sure my editor will appreciate the fact that I just plugged our website. Oh, gee, I wish someone had uh, said something about that so I could make a ticker for it. I know. I, I'm right. sorry. I, I did not think of that at the time because I hate tooting my own horn. But it's all right. We'll, uh, we'll fix it in post. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can we edit that out? No, just kidding. Um, and then, uh, Elizabeth, you're going to be premiering your uh, gender bent uh, Sherlock and Watson costumes at DragonCon this year, right? I am. I'm super excited. We're going to be in the uh, fantasy page, the fantasy tracks page to stage competition on Thursday night. And then um, I'll actually be in a couple more Brit track panels, uh, the Jane Austen one, for example. Uh, and last year, uh, they actually had to tell Andrew Hartley and I to be quiet and let other people talk. Um, so, uh, yeah, so anybody coming to the panels, I apologize for how uh, how much I'm going to talk about how thirsty Captain Wentworth makes me. But, you know, <laughs> sorry, come to the come to the panel and get some honesty from the panelists. So, well, you know, super I, excited I about Dragon Club this year. Persuasion reference. So, uh Congrats. Oh, well, it's a persuasion panel, so oh, well, you came to the right place. Oh, what, is it all about the new the new movie? Because I, I, I've heard some mixed reviews. It's about all adaptations. Uh, it's not for everybody, but I was here for it. But I never met a persuasion I don't like, so. <laughs> and you'll find out more about that at the persuasion panel at DragonCon. Um... Tonight, right. actually, when this airs, you know shut up. it will probably have already happened, so. There yeah. you go. Um, oh, no, it's where, too late. Turn back. Where can you find we stuff need a about Brick <laughs> Well, you can go to the Facebook group, which is the Brit Track at Dragon Con. You can also find us on Twitter at Brit Track and uh, Instagram at DC Brit Track. And then we also have our YouTube channel. Again, look for the Brit Track at Dragon Con. Uh, we're going to be posting things all weekend, uh, all of our other virtual panels. We're going to have links to them. We're going to have announcements. We're going to take pictures. Uh, we are going to have a couple of videos on TikTok, I'm sure. So uh, the Monty Python experience is going to be Friday night at 10 uh, in uh, the Marriott A601, A602. We're going to be having uh, a in addition to skits that you can listen to and participate in, we're going to have a, an actual argument clinic and we are going to be having a fish slapping dance competition. <laughs> so come one, come all. Look forward to seeing you there. And thank you very much, guys. Y'all have a wonderful night and uh, enjoy the rest of Dragon Con. Thank you, folks. Good night.